This is a McLaren 720S, a sub three second supercar hailing from the humble town of Working in Surrey, UK. Heyo people, Philip Blank here, and today on Start It Up, we'll be walking through this beautiful 720S McLaren. Now the McLaren right here is one of my favorite cars that is currently out on the road. It's definitely a contender for the Uricon or the GT2 RS or similarly priced supercars. Just the tech it has in there, the agility, the speed, the horsepower, uh, definitely makes it a solid base for a car. Starting out on the exterior, this baby has a beautiful purple metallic that really looks black until the sunlight hits it just right. Now in a world of neon Jeeps and all the other bright colored supercars out there, it's definitely more subtle. Not that it's a sleeper, but it doesn't scream the same as a bright red Ferrari. When you see it out of the corner of your eye, it draws you to the lines and things other than just the color itself. Uh, you don't always know what you're looking at until you recognize what it really is. You see, oh, that's a 720S, and, and you get a lot more excited from that than just a bright Lamborghini that everybody knows, oh, that's a bright, bright Lamborghini. So I'm a fan of this color. Now all over, we have a whole bunch of carbon fiber accents. Now typically, supercars use a whole lot of carbon fiber in not just the accents like your roof and engine cover, but the frame has got the carbon fiber forged interior, you have your carbon ceramic brakes, you typically go for that lighter material just to save weight compared to the competing alloys. Starting with the dimensions, the 720S is 178.9 inches long, 85 inches wide, and 47 inches tall. Now, as the British say, in the bonnet, on the key, you hold it, pops open, there's no lock underneath, so just straight up. Now on the side here, we have the spot for your owner's manual. That's one of the nicest owner's manuals I've ever gotten to read. And it actually is very clear as far as owner's manuals go. It gives definite instructions and clear pictures on everything you need to know. And since there's no glove box in the car, they keep that up here. You can see it's got a little beat up from the driving just from sitting inside its net. Typically you could put that in a little bag. Now also up here, your battery is hidden behind this panel the plug in and then you'll plug that up and then this can just be indefinitely left on there for months it'll keep your battery at the proper amount now also we have in here the tool bag so fix a flat there's no spare they're just hoping that you can get emergency repaired just to get you where you need to go to your tires um, we also have your latch point your tow bar and then your gas funnel so you don't spill on the edge and then the tool which is a snap-on T for opening up your engine in an emergency now here's where you fill your fluids now this is your steering fluid as this is a hydroelectric steering system it's not fully electric they definitely said they like the responsiveness of that system on this side your wiper fluid and your brake fluid read your owner's manual before messing with any of that Going around to the rear where all the fun happens, this car is rear-wheel driven, giving a lot more play on the track with the back end being a bit more free. Getting into the powerhouse and specs of this butte, the 720S houses McLaren's M840T engine, which is a 4-liter twin-turbo V8, boasting 710 horsepower and 568 pound-feet of torque. McLaren put in a seamless shift 7-speed gearbox, which works by engaging the next gear just a split second before the shift giving really no noticeable loss in torque, making the shifting speed purely incredible when driving this thing. This engine and transmission setup will push the 720S to 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds, a quarter mile in 10.4 seconds, and 0 to 186 in 22.4. The top speed of this car is 212, which is pretty nuts, and the stopping distance from 62 miles per hour to 0 is 93 feet. Typically, rear engine cars need a big old scoop on the side or roof to get the air into the intake for the rear engine, uh, but the McLaren does this by having the side panels scooping the air over the body. It takes the turbulent air, rolls it through, and then pulls it down in. One of my favorite parts of the car is all the real vents. I mean, every single spot you see a curve, they actually did fluid dynamics on this to see where the air was entering the system and where they needed to route it through to either cool the coolers, um, head to the brakes, go to the intake. Just really awesome to see they actually put intention into having all of these as they are. 
The suspension on this thing is another really impressive feature. The dynamic control algorithm, which was developed in partnership with Cambridge University, is a hydraulic setup controlled by a continuously variable solenoid controlling a needle valve. Each wheel has an independent adaptive dampener and the system constantly monitors between the external road factors controlling the drive and the user input which affects how it handles. The dry weight is 2,917 pounds and the curb weight with a fuel tank of gas which is 19 gallons is 3,139 pounds. As for handling, we got some wide and sticky Michelin Pilot Sport 4s on here. So it typically comes with your Pirelli P0s, but with these tires and the 15 inch carbon ceramic brakes, the 720 will do exactly what you tell it. Now open the fuel cap, simply push it in, pops out. It is electronically locked, so if your car is running, it will not open your gas. Uh, make sure you're only running super premium fuel in here. Uh, in the toolkit up front, as I showed, there is a funnel, and that is what they recommend you use just to prevent any drips get on your paint, anything like that but you still can also just use your nozzle like standard. So now it's time to get inside and start this baby up. So on the back side of here is your grip. As you can see, there's no handles. There is a touch button and that is how you open the door. To lock the car whenever your key is in your pocket, if you don't want to have to get it out, there is a small button back here. You hold your finger on it closes up your mirror. Then you don't have to click that to unlock it. Just automatically grab your handle. Everything unlocks for you. Gotta love the Gullwing beautiful doors. Dihedral doors. And what we've done differently this time is to take the doors up and into the roof and make it very easy to step in and out of the car. And we have the carbon fiber panel rather than the glass you can have as an option. As I was saying earlier, you have the carbon forged frame and body all around they put it into a mold in random strands rather than using a weave with the rest of the body. And this is drastically stronger and lighter than a lot of your alloys. There's definitely still good uses for a lot of that as well. Now on here, this is what you click to disarm the tow-away sensor. So if it senses movement, the alarm won't go off. Now when I close the door, I typically grab the hook just again to keep handprints from getting on there, but once you get to a certain point, you really just have to grab up top and close it down. And then you have your emergency door release if your power is out. And that is a mechanical unlock for your door. Go ahead and climb in on this. Now right off the bat, we are greeted by the home screen and the aerodynamic stream of the touchscreen. You can see their teardrop inspiration for the overall shape of the car. Now at first, you notice that everything is surrounded by Alcantara. Not a huge fan of the material. I mean, it's on everything, just that suede, um, but not too bad at all. Uh, it feels definitely like getting into a spaceship with some of these options and you really don't know what everything does at first light, but after spending some time in here, you really start to see, okay, that makes sense, and you can tell how much effort they put into all the design intents and things like that. Now, as we know, sadly, McLarens don't get used as often as they should, so they put an option in here to show how many days of battery life it'll go just sitting without uh, dying out, draining your battery completely, so this one's got 25 days. When you drive or keep it plugged in, it'll up that. Starting on the left side, the three buttons we got here is your hood, open up the bonnet, you have your door lock, so this is how you lock your car, and then you got your display up and down. So that switches between your track display and your full-on display. Since you need to know a lot of your critical engine lights and stuff when the track display is on, on the left here and on the right, we have all the important info being saved. Now. Your standard brights, you can flash them, click them forward, get your paddle shifters, both sides. Down below here, you have your selector, and this is how you control your heads-up display settings in there, and this is push to talk. Over here, you have your cruise control and your lift for going over curbs and speed bumps, things like that. This button here, you have your mirror control, left and right, pretty self-explanatory, and then your park alarm for parking assist. 
click that in and out. The other controls we got, your arrow is what adjusts the wing and the rear. If you want it up or down, it'll change how much drag you have when you're braking. Um, our selectors, so you have handling, which is the H, comfort, sport, and track, and P for powertrain, comfort, sport, and track. For these to work and be in use, you have to click the active button first, and that is what will allow them to turn on and select between. This is your electronic stability control, and this is your manual transmission if you want to override and only use your paddle shifters. We'll go ahead and get the battery on. Everything lights up. Now the way this screen setup works, it's like a rotary system. So you can slide down up between all your options and it just keeps going like a rolling tumbler. This is a cool feature. This here is your home button and this little emblem is actually the logo of the McLaren factory. So by saying home, rather than putting a little picture of a home, they put a picture of the McLaren's actual home where it came from. So let's enter our AC mode. I'm typically not a fan when they don't have physical AC control because a lot of times you don't want to have to look down to see what it's doing. You can just naturally reach, turn the fan up and down. Um, this one's not too bad, it's a little fun. We got our driver here with the helmet just because it's a race car, but your heated seats are in this mode as well. There is no cooling seats in this version. So we'll go ahead and go to the home. And also on the home, we have our settings menu. You have your standard things, your general, your sound for equalizer, setting up phone, um, but you also have in the lighting page, you can adjust pretty much every setting, how long you want to lights to be on when you enter, exit, footwell, courtesy lighting, when it greets you when you come along. Also, you have the ambient lighting page. So this controls uh, what color you want your lights down below to be. There's also lights in the door. Obviously, you can't see it here very well in the daylight, but you can adjust whatever color you want that to be, just to match your style of your car. In the vehicle setting, there are all kinds of controls for what style you want your car to be running in. You have things like when do you want to put down your racetrack mode display. Um, putting your car in reverse, do you want both mirrors to adjust so you can see your wheel lines, uh, your camera guidelines. There are multiple pages of how many options you can set just to get all the exact parts that you want. You have valet mode, you put in your pin, and then you can give that and it'll limit how quickly this car will run and it'll also limit, limit the rev. Down below, we also have your hazard lights. I'm not a huge fan of the noise. That's the blinker noise as well. What can you do? And then your launch control. There is no park in this car in the typical sense like a automatic is. This, you have to think of it more like a manual, put it into drive mode, neutral, or reverse. And for your car to be in park, you have the parking brake over here on the side. If you get out of the car and don't turn your parking mode on, it'll start to roll off if you're in neutral. So this is a little odd feature where you have to think like a manual and an automatic. It's, it's really a hybrid between them. Now that makes sense though because this transmission does not have a parking gear. So it works based off of a parking brake. Down below you also have your typical 12 volt plug. And then in the glove box we have two access points to USB, one for your phone if you want to direct wire, and then your aux in there as well if you don't use Bluetooth for some reason. As with most supercars, there is very little storage in this thing. So you have a spot to put your phone. You could put a bag up there, but we do not have the package on there for the tie down to strap anything down. On the edges, you do have these small little neat pockets for any accessories you have, keep things from rolling around, but there is no glove box on either side. So we've walked through all the settings in here. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and start it up. The startup process, again, parking brake must be on. We got it on right there, signified. And then you hold the brake. Ooh, that's pretty. Yeah, the 
feel of this guy is just so smooth. With these tires, they are not cool weather tires, so they are pretty slick at the moment. Definitely don't want to push anything, but it's still very, very snappy. Now the exhaust is not too loud. A lot of times you will be definitely bothered in the cab just from an instant shift. My goodness. Anyways, the noise, a lot of times you'll be, your head will rattle just like in a GT3 RS or some other, like a Lotus Zeej or something where it's made for the track. This is definitely track and comfortable. I mean, we got the AC running. We got really great audio. Uh, the speakers are definitely, definitely wonderful. Now this has got a 19 gallon tank. That is a decently large tank for something like this. I and mean, there's a lot of space they're putting into the fuel. And that's why the uh, maximum curb weight goes up quite a bit with your fuel. The miles per gallon is an estimated about 18, 19 combined, 22 on your highway or so. If you actually ever get that, not sure. But if you stick to a decent amount of fuel and stay on your comfort mode, you can hit over 400 miles of range on a full tank. That's actually pretty good for a touring car. Um, again, there's not much cargo space up front where you would have the ability to have much luggage and there's really nothing in the back without cutting off your view. I was reading in their uh, aspect about the electro hydraulics. They like the hydraulic aspect because you have some feedback as opposed to the servo, which locks out more in a standard power steering. This one, you definitely have that aggressive feel. Um, it's not the tightest. I think the some Porsches are, are just a little bit tighter when you when you zig it zags, and it's very aggressive. But right now we are in sport mode. I'll switch the handling over to track. Now I'm not going to mess with it now, but the variable drift control, what you do is you shut your electronic power control off and then you have to enable the drift mode. So we'll shut it off and then activate. Now this is where you control how much give you want on your back end. Richard Hammond on the Grand Tour gave an excellent demonstration of why you don't want it slid all the way to the side. I think we'll go for all of it. Lots of drift available. Yeah, maybe less than that, I think. And the reason we got two different sliders here is on your powertrain, when you switch between what you're wanting, handling-wise, uh, it selects between how much slides, so you can have a quick adjustment there. Going over some train tracks. Remember, in low cars, take it slow. You do not want to hit your carbon fiber splitter up front. This baby is quick. Always stay within the speed limit. interesting feature you don't see on a lot of cars is our speed limiter. So you typically have a cruise control that will tell you how fast you want your car to maintain. Well there is also a high-end speed limiter because with something like this you can go 0 to 100 in about 6 seconds. 124 in 7.8 seconds, 8.9 seconds I believe. So this will get going real quick. By putting a speed limiter on it'll help you avoid tickets just because you're not going for that. We don't have a desire to get in trouble and things like that. Now, this paddle shifters work the same way as most other paddle shifters do. Uh, the car is automatic, but if you want, you can override, especially if you put it into the track mode, click manual, it will listen to what you tell it. If you're in the sport mode or your manual, manual button is off, It'll do the auto shifts for you, but if I say I want to drop down a shift right here, I can tell it to, to give me that little bit of rev. Now this 
car is definitely a masterpiece of engineering. I mean, every thought and aspect they put into this on all the little details. There's very few nitpicky things that I would change about it. Um, one, I've heard it mentioned before and I agree, the seat control, was, which is up here on your right front by your knee, and it's, it's the mirror for the passenger. The buttons are, one, not super intuitive. Uh, after you mess around with a little bit, it's totally fine. Um, you, you've got all your controls up, down, back, forward, uh, your lumbar, but they are a little bit squeaky and loose. I mean, everything in here is solid, and when you're paying that much for a car, you want that higher excellence and just precision, but these, I mean, I don't know if you can hear that. That's not clicking it, that's just touching it. It wobbles and it makes a little bit of a squeaky noise. Um, I think they could put a little more thought into that, uh, give it either some metal tactile feel or something just to make it a little more responsive. Drive modes, I typically always leave it in your sport. Um, the track will make your ride a little bit rougher and with the sport, your torque curve, your power curve is, is plenty and still lots of fun. So I also like the display being popped up. I know you can change that in the settings to where if you go to track, it won't close it up, but I personally like to not mess with that if I ever did want it to go there. Um, so I leave it in the sport mode. And that concludes our start it up. So let me know if you have any questions or comments down below. I'll be sure to get back with you and uh, help out the best that I can. Thanks for watching.